Good afternoon, church. Welcome to our 5.30 service. In Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2, it says, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Why don't we all rise as we sing to the Lord with one voice. Church, let us sing of His incomparable holiness. Because He alone is worthy of everything we could ever sing. He alone is worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Ah. Uh -huh. 
is indeed our firm foundation. And on Him, we should build our lives on. This should give us an assurance that we are anchored in solid ground. We will not be shaken, even if we face a task that is unfinished, an ongoing mandate to know Christ, to go out there and make Him known.
place and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped god saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our god forever and ever amen what the angels shouted with all their voices saying blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks honor and power and might be to you forever and ever and all of God's people say amen and amen the Lord God be praised you may take your seats Good evening, church. We are the Wetfoot team who went to Baler Aurora last April 30 to May 5 this year. We helped to mobilize the church members of Baler Conservative Baptist Church by conducting a training in presenting the gospel. We have strategized things the way we thought is best, but the Lord showed his own plans for us. Most of the things we prepared weeks before we have we leave, we're not used. This is because two days before we left, a training on evangelism was held. 
we attended and realized that it could be the perfect material to bring to the people of Baler. We asked the facilitators if we can bring the same material. They agreed and even provided all the presentations needed. On May 1st, the training for the church in Baler was held. It was attended by youths, adults, and church leaders. A two-day house-to-house evangelism came a day after, an opportunity to practice what we have learned in the training. We were blessed to see how obedient the church members are in sharing the gospel. We also met a boy of age of 12, son of a member of the church, who accompanied our team in doing the house-to-house evangelism. Immediately, he learned how to share the gospel by just observing us and eventually share the gospel to his friends the same afternoon. On May 4, we traveled for an hour and a half to a community of Aitas where we served food and presented the gospel. There were kids ages 3 to 12 years old and some parents. The challenge for our team was we were advised to conduct the gospel presentation just before the event. It was easy to refuse and say that we are not ready. We were not trained to share the gospel to these little kids, but the Lord again provided an idea that we worked on the night before the event. We prepared crafts that made the sharing meaningful and easy to understand. We were in awe as we see the kids actively participating in the gospel sharing and how the Lord is working in their lives. We concluded our missions trip in a Sunday worship service to thank the Lord who pleasantly surprised us. The people to whom we have shared the gospel with during the house-to-house evangelism came to attend the worship or the Sunday service for the first time. Even though the local church had been inviting and evangelizing for quite some time. Our hearts are filled with joy and praises to the Lord as He let us witness His faithfulness among His people. We have been blessed with the testimonies of the missionaries and workers we have worked with. These are the things we couldn't have seen if we have just stayed in our cozy and laid-back life back here in Manila. We were completely blown away on how the Lord could use timid, skeptical, inexperienced, incapable, self-doubting people like us. One of us had been skeptical about missionaries that they are not really doing enough to proclaim the gospel or not properly using the financial support they are receiving. God used the mission trip in opening our eyes to see the hard work and sacrifice of our, of, of our missionaries. As a result, we are now giving our time, talent, and treasures for missions. Through this trip, the Lord showed His great mercy and grace as He graciously provided everything as we perfectly needed them. Indeed, the Lord ways are beyond what we can grasp. He affirmed to us His sovereignty over everything. In addition, Palur Conservative Baptist Church, headed by Pastor Ray Etcobanes, along with his wife, Dr. Abel Etcobanes, celebrated the 30th anniversary last June. Praise God for his faithfulness. To God be the glory. Excellence is what makes someone go, oh, wow. And then they see the God behind the excellence. It, it speaks volumes of, of the God who blesses someone. They will ask, what is it that makes you shine? And then you give them the story. Give them first, of course, important. You tell them there's the God who enables. but. The, the Lord enables, gives you opportunity, but you also do your job. You study and you perfect your craft. You have enough clout because you have wonderful works. People are going to listen to you. When you finally say things that hindi normal mo sinasabi, 
to talk about God, then they listen. Kesa yung talk about God muna, and then hindi, hindi sumusunod yung trabaho. Parang, talk about God, hindi na, ang sama naman ng trabaho. Or, oh, substandard, maybe okay. And then you share to them that there is the power that can make you do things not because you are good, but because the Holy Spirit causes you to act accordingly, to be generous, to be giving, to be caring, to go beyond what is aesthetics. And to me, that is the wonderful thing that, you know, that Christian has to offer. They see they can come to you, uh, and that has become my ministry. My ministry is not the actual church. My ministry venue usually is in Starbucks. You know, I, I meet up one by one, and they share their love lives, iba-ibang so yeah, financial problems, paano sila kikita as artists. So, we try to look for ways. Hindi lang yung hindi, ganito ko yung It's being part of their lives, knowing na it's very important na maging pumasok ka sa buhay nila. Medyo uncomfortable kasi maraming kapang ginagawa sa buhay. Pero, why are we here for? I mean, you know, kaya nga tayo nandito eh. To be there, and sometimes we miss that part. Uh, I'm Junji Marcelo, and uh, married to a beautiful wife, <laughs> to uh, Anna Marcelo. And uh, I am a music producer. Uh, I do music servicing for jingles, theme music for you know corporate theme songs, and also songs for albums. What I do. Again, if you would like to hear and listen and watch the full story, please visit those online channels of the church. And as we continue the celebration of Missions Month this month, we will uh, certainly hear more stories, even similar to what was shared by the Wetfoot Baler team. At this point, we just like to welcome those who are here for the very first time. If this is your first time to attend a worship service with us here in this building in GCF, may we ask you to stand. We just want to recognize you. We want to know who you are. So if you can please stand and allow us this time to welcome you. Anyone who is a guest? All right. Well, at this point, we will pray together. I'd like to call Pastor Larry to this time of pastoral prayer. And of course, I'd like to request the pastors, the elders, and the other church leaders to please stand by as you will be called on later. It's my joy to lead you in prayer tonight. And as usual, we have a ministry here that we ask you all to pray with me for the country. We're just going to pray for one item for the Philippines. That's the choice of a speaker of the House of Congress. You know that Congress has lately been pushing same-gender marriage. So the speaker of the House will be selected on July 22 among themselves will be very crucial to pushing or not same-gender marriage and gay rights and other things that are going down in this country. And you know, it will have a domino effect on everything in this country once we pass a same-gender marriage law here. For the church, we'll be praying for the mission month. Just two items. The successful Think Right Conference praise item, but we'll also pray for a good follow-up of that because we don't just want the participants filled with head knowledge. We want them to become catalysts in their churches, including this one, in an apologetics a movement. You know, we have an apologetics Bible study every Sunday. We hope that you will join that or start one wherever you are. Please join me in a word of prayer. And at the end, uh, in the middle, we'll ask you to stand if you have any prayer needs. And our pastors and elders will come beside you and pray with you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful worship time we just had. To be reminded, Lord, that there is a task and finished. And the people sitting in this place tonight are part of making that task become finished. When we see ourselves, Lord, as the missionaries of the Lord, not just of this church, because we belong to a greater organization, and that is the body of Christ. And we are your missionaries, Lord, whatever calling you have called us to do, whether it be 
in the workplace or in the classroom or in the home, the community, the clan, the clinic, the, the factory. Lord, we are all called to be your missionaries. And we're reminded of that, Father, even today as we continue Missions Month. Father, as a ministry of our church, as a ministry of the church family, we gather tonight before praying for ourselves to pray for our beloved country. And Lord, we specifically pray for the incoming Speaker of the House of Congress to be selected on July 22. Lord, we ask for your mercy to be upon our country because we know some of our congressmen are strongly pushing for a same-gender marriage bill to be to become law and father this has become a very very big concern for the evangelicals for the believers in this country lord we pray that the person who will become the speaker of the house of congress will be a person of principles and convictions and remember this country was founded on moral values and lord we pray that that person will set aside partisan politics pressure lord from people who are in power but instead look at the people and what they need and be loyal to the constitution not to any person in power we pray that you have mercy in our country lord please don't let us go down this path and we ask you lord to intervene in the halls of congress in the hearts of our lawmakers father now we pray for our church it is with much thanksgiving that we thank you for the success of the Think Right Apologetics Conference where over 700 people came. And Father, we pray that they will now be catalysts and, and the advocates, Lord, of an apologetics movement inside our respective churches and places of worship, beginning in our own church, Lord, where more than 80% of the people came from. May we realize how basic it is that we know how to defend our faith, to contend for the faith, earnestly delivered once and for all to the saints. And Father, we pray that you continue to ignite our hearts, Lord, as we continue Missions Month, to become missional believers who support cross-cultural evangelization, Lord, with all our hearts. May you always be like that. But Father, help us see that missional living is what you've called all of us without exception to do, whether we cross cultural barriers or not. And Father, tonight we ask for the privilege of your people, allowing us to pray with them, to have the courage and the humility to stand and let their prayer needs be known so that our pastors and elders can come beside them and pray with them. Beloved, tonight, if you have any prayer needs of any kind, whether it's a celebration or a burden, will you please just stand where you are and move to the side, to the aisle? Thank you, sir. Uh, I see you here. Uh, yeah, I see a, a lady and a brother here. Thank you. Elder Bonnie and uh, Pastor Emmer. Is there anyone else? In the balcony? Uh, yes, we have people there, so... Yes, thank you. Our elders' wives and pastors' wives usually stand up when it's a lady. So I see one of our... And then I need uh, another brother over there to pray for someone in the balcony. Down here, is there anyone else? Give us a chance to pray for you. Yes, our uh, yes, our ushers are very much servants of the Lord. Thank you for praying with our brother upstairs. Okay, as they're being prayed for, could you pray silently for a couple of minutes for yourself, for the country, or for this church as we go through Missions Month?
I'll continue to pray even while our brethren are prayed for. And Father, we pray for our speaker tonight. We thank you for the blessing of having such a well-known and distinguished speaker, Lord. And that you blessed Pastor Greg Kokel with all the education, the experience, the influence, Father to become one of the most well-known defenders of the Christian faith. And tonight, Father, as He speaks before us tonight, may Your Holy Spirit be upon Him, Lord, and in the hearts of all the listeners, as we are reminded powerfully from the Word to contend earnestly for the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. Lord, I pray that tonight when we leave this place, we will all be enthusiastic instructed, inspired people about how and why we must defend the faith. And we pray, Lord, that you'll use your servant tonight for this purpose, Pastor Greg Kukul. And Lord, I pray that all of this will be to the glory of your name as we lift up Jesus Christ in our midst tonight. For this we pray and for this we ask in the name of the one who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead and is coming back any time to take us with Him. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
message, and I pray a prayer that we all have this evening. Let's open God's Word together. Please open your Bibles to the book of Jude, and we will read together verses 1 to 4 before Pastor Larry introduces formally our guest speaker this evening. We will read first Jude verses 1 to 4. Let's all stand in reverence to the Word of God. Jude, verse 1, together. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading of His Word. Please be seated. My great joy to introduce to you our speaker tonight who has been with us for three days now as he conducted the Think Right Apologetics Conference together with Dr. Patrick Zuckerman. But uh, we are so blessed because our brother is a, an award-winning writer and best-selling author. Greg Kukul has written several books including The Story of Reality, How the World Began, How It Ends, and Everything Important in Between. Another book is Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. And this last one, I like the title, Relativism, Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. It's a good description. Greg has been featured on Focus on the Family Radio, has been interviewed for CBN and the BBC. He's been quoted in Christianity Today, the U.S. News and World Report, and the L.A. Times. Pastor Greg Kukul received his Master's in Philosophy of Religion and Ethics at Talbot School of Theology, graduating with high honors. And he has a Master's in Christian Apologetics with honors from Simon Greenleaf University. He is an adjunct professor in Christian Apologetics, at Biola University. Beloved, let's welcome to our pulpit tonight, Pastor Greg Kukul. Pastor. Well, salamat. It's the only Tagalog word I know. But it's a good one. Did I say it right? I figured if... I come to Philippines, this is my first trip, I better learn an important word. Did you know, by the way, I did a study once in the New Testament of all the prayers, all the references to prayer, 
not just where it says prayer, but all the time it talks about prayer. And the prayer that, or the, or the thing that is mentioned most often in the New Testament is praying to give thanks, being thankful. So, Salamat to the Lord is a good way to start our session tonight. About, um, about nine years ago, my wife and I sat on a short bench in a small stone church on the outskirts of Oxford, England. And in the tiny graveyard just outside of that church was a flat tombstone with the name Clive Staples Lewis etched into the granite. And the pew that my wife and I were actually sitting in was the very same place that C.S. Lewis had sat every Sunday with his brother Warney as they worshiped together there in that small church called Trinity Church. And this man, C.S. Lewis, who has become somewhat of a, of, a, of a hero to me over my years as a Christian, probably more than anyone else in the 20th century, lived out the admonition of the text that was just read to you today. And I would like to use that text kind of as a springboard to talk to you about troubles that we face as a community, as a church, and how we can address those troubles. So let me read the, the relevant part of the passage to you, verse 3 in Jude. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. And never before in my own lifetime, dear friends, has this verse been more important for us as Christians to hear and to consider and to heed. Let me just point out three elements that you see in that passage that I want to develop more on as we move forward. First thing I want you to see is a kind of a content there. Jude writes, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. In other words, he's referring to a very specific thing that had specific content. Second was an admonition. He said, I'm appealing that you contend earnestly. In other words, you, you proclaim the faith, you guard the faith, and you defend the faith. And finally, he talks about kind of a history of this, the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. It was something that was passed on from generation to generation by the disciples in the church. And I want to tell you why I think Jude's admonition is so timely to us here in the end of the second decade of the 21st century. We are facing, I think, the cultural and theological fight of our lives. Now, I'm not Filipino. I, like I said, this is my first time here, so I don't know your culture really well. Um, but I'm an American, and I understand American culture, and what I've been able to see is the influences of secularism in American culture and how it's influenced the church there, and I suspect it's probably similar to the kind of thing that you're facing here in the Philippines. And, and what I see is the culture heating up in very aggressive ways against Christianity. When I say against Christianity, it's really heating up against God, and they're attacking God by attacking Christianity. And there, there's trouble on two broad fronts, and just for simplicity's sake, let me put it this way. Christians are facing trouble in the world, or I should say trouble from the world, but they're also facing trouble in the church. Trouble in the world and trouble in the church. And I want to spend my brief time with you this evening outlining a little bit of what that trouble looks like and then offer an antidote that I think will allow us to fulfill this directive that we see in Jude to contend earnestly for 
the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Now, many of you are aware of the first front. If you are a Christian, that, and when I say Christian, I don't mean somebody who sits in a church. I mean somebody who follows Jesus. You are committed to Christ and living the way Christ wants you to live and believing the things that Christ believe about the world. And if you're that kind of a Christian and you're living in the world right now, you're already aware that the, that the world is opposing you and the Christ that you follow. And there are attacks in a couple of different ways. One of them is on the content of the things that we believe. The last 20 years, we've seen a rise, for example, in vocal atheism and a group called the New Atheists for men who have made kind of a big splash for atheism in the last 20 years and followed by many more writing books trying to undermine people's confidence in God. And our story begins in the beginning, God, right? Those are the first lines of our story. It's the first verse of the Bible. But if there's no God, if people are convinced that there's no God, then there's no sense paying any attention to our story. So this is a strong challenge to Christianity. We also have challenges on the authority of the Bible itself, and books are being written by people who are clever writers who are challenging the authority of Scripture and the reliability of Scripture. We have a strong challenge now even on the person of Jesus on a couple of different fronts. One of the most popular things going around the universities now is the idea that Jesus never lived that the entire account that we read in the Gospels of the life of Jesus is just a recycling of ancient mythology that we find in Egypt and the ancient Near East. Now, just so you know, there is not a historian worth his salt nowadays, a real historian, a credential historian, that will say that Jesus never lived. But rather, they understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the primary source documents of the life of Jesus to be reliable broadly in its historical content. But the rank and file in the university and running around the internet, they get an entirely different story. So here's another place now where people are simply not taking us uh, seriously. Incidentally, um, just so you know, in all of these places where there is a content knowledge, academic kind of attack on Christianity, I want you to know that we have people on our team, I don't mean stand to reason team, I mean the body of Christ team, tremendous, educated, smart, academic people who have stepped up to answer every single one of the challenges. So we have a tremendous defense against this. But a lot of Christians don't know about the defense that we've talked about, for example, this weekend at this conference. And certainly a lot of non-Christians don't know it. So this is one big area where there's a challenge, a full court press, if you will, against Christianity. But there's another area of challenge from the world <clears throat> because in the midst of this kind of academic attack, there's an increasingly pervasive godlessness and almost militant relativism in the culture. Now, when I use the word relativism, I mean something very particular. I mean a point of view that truth is determined completely by the individual. You have your truth, I have my truth. You have your morality, I have my morality. You can live the way you want, that's your business, but I get to live the way I want. Morally, I can live the way I want. I can define reality whatever way I want. Now, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, and when I started college, it was the 60s, and all of this was kind of new back then. I had no idea it would get to the point that it's gotten to now. Because back in the 60s, the big deal was the sexual revolution. You know, we want to sleep with who we want to sleep with. But mostly the idea was we want to sleep with the member of the opposite sex that we want to sleep with. Now it's we want to have whatever kind of sexual satisfaction we want. And not only whatever kind of sexual satisfaction we want, but we get to decide what kind of sex we are. I never imagined it would come to this either, where one's gender now is a matter of one's choice. 
Let me give you an insight about what's going on. We have to deal with all of these kinds of challenges in the culture. We have to meet that. We have to talk about it. And we discuss this at Stand to Reason. We write, we train Christians to help to deal with it. But I want to tell you something. None of this is what it seems. Because all of this conversation and conflict in our culture, LGBT, gender dysphoria, which, by the way, there is a real gender dysphoria, and it's tragic for the very small number of people that is beset by it, and we should have charity towards them and, and love them and, and try to help them. But this movement, it's not about sex. It's not about gender. It's about who is in charge. That's what it's about. Who is in charge? The creature or the creator? The potter or the clay? And the answer coming from the culture is the clay is in charge. That's the nature of this battle. And there is especially intense hostility towards those who take Jesus seriously, especially regarding the Great Commission. Am I doing that? Is that me? Making that noise? It's especially intense regarding the those who are committed to fulfilling the Great Commission, that is, taking the message to those who desperately need it, which is everybody, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, not anyone else, not anything else. There is no other route. There is no other way. Every single person has fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person is lost before their, sa their God because they have rebelled against him. And they are guilty of sedition, but there is a rescue plan. There is a rescuer. God come down, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus of Nazareth, who has come to save us, and no one else can do that. That message, Jesus' message, that is wildly politically incorrect. And when you preach that message, you invite a tsunami of scorn and derision from the culture. But that's the message that we have been entrusted with. And when we proclaim that message, his message, we're courting conflict. And in fact, in the last 15 years or so, it's gotten worse. Because one of the things the new atheists brought to the, 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 the discussion, brought to the table, was not just that Christians were wrong. They've always believed that. The new atheists are new, not in new arguments or new information. They are, they are new in new attitude. <laughs> and particularly the attitude that Christians aren't just wrong, Christians are dangerous. Now, I had never encountered that before. And I think part of it is a result of what happened in the United States on September on 911, basically, when Muslim terrorists attacked the United States and caused the death of 2,977 human beings on American soil, because that changed the attitude of people towards religion in America in a very profound way. Right after that accident, or that uh, attack, I should say, Thomas Friedman a writer for the New York Times, wrote an article that he titled The Real War. And in that article, reflecting on the attack that we had just experienced, he said that the war that we're in now is not a war against terrorism. Terrorism is just a means to another end. The war that we're in now is a, a war about what he called religious totalitarianism. Now, what is religious totalitarianism? To put it simply, religious totalitarianism is any view of a religion where the people think that religion is actually true. Now, let me ask you, do you think that the Muslims who flew those planes into the Twin Towers in New York City and into the Pentagon and crashed into that field in Pennsylvania, did they believe that their religion was true? Yes, of course they did. That's why they were willing to give their lives for it. But so do just about everyone in this room. You also believe your religion, the claims of Jesus, are true. 
But Thomas Friedman did make the distinction between Muslim fundamentalists and Christian fundamentalists, where a Christian fundamentalist would likely pray for you, not kill you. He didn't make that kind of distinction. He just lumped them all together. Anyone who thinks his religion is true is dangerous. And it's the first time that I was ever told, essentially, that I'm a dangerous person because I simply believe what my Savior said about himself, that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. But nowadays, them's fighting words in our culture. And if we are simply faithful to that wonderful message of salvation, we're the dangerous people. Trouble in the world. But there's also trouble in the church. And it takes a, a number of different forms. One thing that I've noticed for a long time in the church is that, that there's, a, tr- there's a, tr- a tremendous biblical Ill- illiteracy. I don't know how else to put it. Even with Christians who've been in churches most of their lives and sit at sermons every Sunday, still they seem to know very little about Christianity. Oh, they know a few things about Jesus, but understanding the big picture, the, 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 the larger world view, this escapes them. Their Christianity is, well, in the States, I would say a mile wide and an inch deep, but here I've got to say two and a half kilometers wide and a couple of millimeters deep. And that width is almost all emotion for many Christians. They're going on emotion, and then when tough times come and the emotions change, they have no depth to survive. I had a conversation. I should say I was part of a a panel discussion once on a stage with a Jewish audience. There was about 600 Jewish people who had met together in Rosh Hashanah for the high holidays there, and I was invited, along with a Roman Catholic priest, by the Jewish host, who is a friend of mine, Dennis Prager, a fairly well-known talk show host in the United States, to answer questions from Dennis by two Christians, Catholic tradition, Protestant tradition, of the Jews that were in the audience. Dennis was asking the questions. Now, I uh, I knew the priest, Father Greg Coiro. <clears throat> he and I and Dennis actually had been in many conversations on radio before, sometimes in front of televisions and audiences. And so I was familiar with the setup, but I got the first question from Dennis, and the first question was, is Jesus the only way of salvation? And you can imagine, I get to answer that, which is okay, but... Think of the audience. It's a Jewish audience. If I give the right answer too quickly, it's going to sound like I'm anti-Semitic and God hates Jews because they're Jews and Jews are going to hell because they're Jewish. And in fact, I said that. I, I, I need to tell more about how this all fits together or you'll misunderstand it. And I told the audience, the difficulty is that we, we tend to think of God looking down on the world and seeing different religious clubs. So you have the Jewish club and the Christian club and the Hindu club and the Buddhist club and the Muslim club, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And some people think God plays favorites. And for a long time, well, he liked the Jewish club. That was his favorite. And then he got real mad at the Jewish club. And now he likes the Christian club better and to hell with the rest of them, quite literally. But that isn't the way it works. I explained to them, God doesn't look down and see religious clubs and like one club better than the other club. What he does is he looks down on a world of people he has made to be in friendship and fellowship with him and to a person we have rebelled against him, to a person we have sinned egregiously against him, to a person we are guilty against him, and, guilt, and because we're guilty, we're lost. 
And so out of love for mankind, God initiated a rescue plan. And his plan was to become a human being himself, to get small, to get low, to get down, and to come down in order to provide a means of rescue and salvation and forgiveness for mankind. And he did that in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the promised Messiah, so that Jesus could take the punishment that we deserve. Jesus would be the sacrificial lamb. Jesus would be the scapegoat. And here I'm referring to, obviously, things that relate to the Jewish understanding in the Old Testament of forgiveness. Jesus is that perfect forgiveness, I explained to them. And since he is the perfect and only provision... He is the source of forgiveness if we trust him. If we put our faith in him, then he bears the penalty for our sins. But if we say no to Jesus, then we bear the penalty for our sins. Either Jesus pays or we do. It's a simple equation. And if we pay, that is not going to be a pretty sight. And that's why Jesus is the only way. Doesn't matter whether you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Jew or a Muslim. If you plead with God for forgiveness through his provision, then you will be forgiven. It's not about clubs. Well, when I finished explaining the gospel as clearly and simply as I could, without using a bunch of highfalutin theological spiritual language, but throwing the ball so they could catch it. It was dead silence. In fact, I, I think maybe that was the first time that they'd heard it in a way that made sense. I don't know. But the mic was then passed to Father Coiro. And by the way, I'm gonna, I want to tell you what happened, but I'm not telling you this to beat up on Roman Catholicism. I know there's a lot of Catholics in town, maybe some in the audience here. I'm telling you exactly what happened. You can draw your own conclusions. But in the moment, you'll see that Protestants make the same mistake that Father Coiro made that evening. Because the mic was passed to him, and he was asked the same question. And so now he's going to give the answer from the Roman Catholic perspective. Is Jesus the only way of salvation? And he said, yes, Jesus is the only way of salvation. In fact, Roman Catholicism, or the Roman Catholic Church, is the only true church. But... Not to worry, he told the Jewish audience, because you are all members of the Roman Catholic Church and you don't really realize it. In virtue of the fact that you are here as observant Jews, pursuing Judaism the best way that you know how, you are already under the sacrifice that Jesus made. You are already saved by Jesus even though you reject Jesus, is the point. And not just Jews, it turns out, according to Catholicism now, Muslims as Muslims, Hindus as Hindus, Buddhists as Buddhists. As long as you're all following your own religion, you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Now, it ought to be clear to you, this is not the gospel. This is the opposite of the gospel. And my staff was sitting in the back, and right behind my staff, one of my staffers heard someone say, a man leaned over to his wife after Father Coiro had given his explanation and said to her, don't worry, honey, it's a freebie. Don't worry about what? Don't worry about what Kokel said. That would be me. Don't worry about what he said about needing Jesus. The priest has already told us we don't need to worry about that. And so everything that I gave with the right hand about the gospel of truth to these Jewish people who desperately needed it, my, what appeared to be to them, my Christian brother took away with the left. I said, uh, I'm not just beating up on a Roman Catholic priest. There are lots and lots of Protestants who believe the same thing. 
Lots and lots of Protestants who think it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what religion, as long as you're doing the best you can and you're basically a good person. Is this going to tickle? As long as you do the best as you can and you're basically a good person, you're in. A multitude of Protestants believe that. It's the same thing. That's trouble in the church, friends. We have trouble in the world. We have trouble in the church. So what do we do? How do we fulfill Jude's exhortation? Well, I think Paul gives a simple two-part solution for the challenging times that we're facing, and he does it in 2 Timothy. And I want you to turn there, because I'm going to talk a bit now about application based on what Paul says in 2 Timothy. And as you're turning there in your Bibles, I, I want to tell you a little about the setting of the writing. If you visit Rome and take the right tour, you'll be shown an ancient cistern in the northwest of the city. It's originally meant to hold water. It later, later served as a dungeon. It's called Mamertine Prison. And it's a circular, low-ceilinged, uh, underground room of rock where prisoners were lowered down in a rope. And I've seen pictures of that dismal interior. And off to one side, there's a, there's a, a little ledge. It looks actually like a step, but it doesn't go anywhere because there's a wall there. But it's the only place, if you were lying down, that you could actually write something. And this possibly is the very spot, this small ledge of rock, where the Apostle Paul wrote his last spiritual will and testament that we know as 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was the last thing that Paul wrote. He wrote it just before he was executed. A letter to his disciple, Timothy. And I like 2 Timothy. It's one of my favorite books. In fact, I read it this morning, the whole thing. It took me 20 minutes. It's quick. It speaks forcefully and practically to the kind of challenges that you and I face in the 21st century. It's clear. It's uncomplicated. It's right to the point. And it gives us an answer to our question about how we contend earnestly for the faith. How do we guard the gospel? Because that is the book's theme. Listen to the vigor and the urgency of some of Paul's words out of 2 Timothy. He starts out saying, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Don't be afraid, Timothy. That isn't the spirit God has given us. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and discipline. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. It's interesting, Paul would tell that to his disciple Timothy. Why would he say that? Because probably Timothy is a little bit timid, facing the challenge of the culture. Timothy is a little bit scared. Don't be Timothy. Don't be ashamed. Don't be frightened. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, Paul writes, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me. And then in chapter 1, verse 14, the very next verse, he says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Guard the treasure. That's the theme of this book. Timothy, guard the treasure. I'm on my way out. I'm hanging up my cleats. I'm almost done. It's your turn now. Guard the treasure which is entrusted to you. And in this letter, he tells us exactly what it looks like in the 21st century to contend earnestly for the faith, to guard the treasure that's been entrusted to us. Because at that time, when Paul was writing, the church was also facing trouble on two fronts, trouble in the world and trouble in the church. I just described a, a kind of wave of sorts of persecution, momentum towards that, that we see uh, arising in our secular culture right now towards us. And it's not fun, it's not comfortable, but it's nothing like what they were facing. 
Paul was in prison under Nero. Nero was a cruel tyrant. In AD 64, a fire broke out in Rome. It raged for six days, destroyed massive portions of the city, and the emperor falsely accused the Christians of starting the fire, and that he used that as a pretext for gruesome persecution and, as Tacitus records, the most, quote, exquisite tortures, close quote. In fact, Tacitus writes that the Christians were covered with hides of wild beasts and then thrown to the dogs, or they were nailed to crosses and set fire to, and when day declined, burned to serve for nocturnal lights. And Nero offered his own gardens for that spectacle. In other words, if Nero wanted to have a party at night, you need lights, grab the Christians, crucify them, cover them with pitch, light them on fire, on fire and party hardy. You think you've got it bad. Trouble in the world. And actually, in the midst of that extreme physical persecution of the church, Paul warned of a different problem they would face. There it is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in the first few verses, a kind of moral decay, a godlessness pervading the culture. Here's what he writes. Timothy, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, and on and on he goes with a rogue's list of vice, similar to what we read at the end of Romans chapter 1, same kind of list, and there he adds, they not only do these things, but they give hearty approval to those others who do these things. Trouble in the world for Paul then and Timothy, but there was also trouble in the church. And Paul writes about that in chapter 4. He says, the time will come, Tim, when they will not endure, they Christians will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate to themselves teachers according to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to miss. Paul says, Timothy, here's what's happening. We have teachers in the church, and that's what Jude was warning against when we read the longer passage. People who creep into the church and, and turn the grace of God into sensuality is what Jude says. Same thing here. Teachers that will tickle our ears. Tell us what we want to hear. Pursue your own desires. Make yourself happy. Do what you want. Turning the grace of God into licentiousness. Turning aside to miss. So what is Paul's answer to Timothy's challenge there, which is our challenge here? Trouble in the world, trouble in the church. Now what? Right in between those two sections, the beginning of chapter 3 and the middle of chapter 4, Paul gives Timothy the answer. Chapter 3 and verse 14, but I don't want you to read it. If you have your Bibles open, not yet. I want to give you the first three words, and I want you to notice something about those words. Paul says, here's the answer. Timothy, you, however, continue. Continue. Why did he use that verb? You know, there's a there's a habit in the church that I've noticed for the last 45 years since I've been a Christian of Christians getting drawn to the, the new fad, the novel thing, the new hot spiritual deal that's going on, and books will be written about it, and people will follow after it, and a lot of times it's tied to emotionalism, or it's tied to getting special revelations from God, or hearing the voice of God, or all kinds of spiritual things going on. It's interesting how Paul addresses the problem with Timothy. He does not tell Timothy, trouble in the world, trouble in the church, here's what you do, Timothy, always be in tune 
Keep your eyes open for the movement of the Spirit in the moment. Watch for the new things that God is doing. Be right with it. He doesn't tell Timothy to do that. Instead, he says, and here's the rest of it, you, however, continue in the things that you have learned and have become convinced of. Paul doesn't point Timothy to the future. He points Timothy to the past. He doesn't point Timothy to the new things. He points Timothy to the old things, the foundational things. What are those things? The things, he says to Timothy, you have, you have learned from your grandmother and from your mother from the sacred scriptures. And then he says, for all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and reproof and training and righteousness that the man or woman of God might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Some of you have memorized that verse, and maybe you could say, oh, yeah, that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, but you didn't realize where it sat really in the flow here. This is just about the last thing that Paul ever wrote. And he's telling it to Timothy in the midst of this difficult circumstance that the church finds itself in, trouble in the world, trouble in the church. And Paul tells him to go back to the basics, back to what he has learned. And then Paul amps it up another notch at the beginning of chapter 4. He challenges Timothy with the most sober language he can muster. Think of the language here. I solemnly charge you. Got your attention, Timothy? Oh, wait, there's more. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the one who's going to judge the living and the dead. Are you listening, Timothy? And, oh, and by his appearing and by his kingdom. Do I have your attention yet? Timothy, what comes next? Preach the word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Further down, he writes, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now, 2 Timothy is a pastoral epistle. That is, Paul is writing with instructions to Timothy, who is a young pastor. So the most immediate application of this exhortation is to your pastor and those pastors over you. But Paul is telling your pastor to teach this to you. This is the agenda. Back to the basics. Back to the Scripture. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy, when all else fails, read the directions and follow them. But simply continuing in the truth of the gospel, which is what I'm talking about here, guarding the gospel, it's not enough. Because Paul has more to say to Timothy. I want you to notice something about 2 Timothy. Paul wrote his final letter to a person, not a group. He wrote letters to groups, Corinthians, Philippians, Ephesians. He wrote letters to regions, Galatia, for example. But here he wrote to an individual. He passed the baton of the gospel to a faithful person a young man named Timothy, which is exactly what he told Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 2, 2, which was the second passage I ever memorized as a young Christian. And I actually don't think I memorized it. I think it just stuck because it was so vivid and powerful and important. The first passage that I memorized was Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. That's a pretty good one. That's a good place to start if you're a new follower of Christ. It's a good place to end, actually, if you're an old follower of Christ. My second one, though, the things, Paul told Timothy, the things which you have heard from me, 
in the presence of many witnesses, remember this is the faith once delivered to the saints, it's corporate knowledge, nothing secret, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So note there's four generations there. There's Paul teaching Timothy, who is to teach faithful people who are to teach others as well. Four generations, the baton being handed down from generation to generation. In other words, it's not enough just to continue in the truth yourself. That's pretty important. It has to be handed down. And in fact, guarding the gospel is not complete until it has been passed on effectively. When I became a follower of Christ at UCLA in 1973, I was allowed obnoxious, opinionated, long-haired hippie. And now 45 years later, I am not a long-haired hippie. <laughs> I don't think I'm quite as obnoxious as I used to be either, but whatever transformation God has worked, I owe it really to one man, Craig Englert, who there at the beginning for more than two years, at great risk to life and limb, took me under his wing and discipled me. And I've had other mentors since then, but I know with a certainty that without Craig in my life, at that time in my life, I would not be standing here today at this point in my life. That's how vital it was the time he spent with me. You see, Craig Englert and others who have had an influence in my life since then was not content to simply guard the truth. They needed it to, to entrust it to others, even me, as unlikely as that, that's, that seemed at the time. And it was unlikely in order for the gospel to go forward. In other words, they passed the baton to me just as Paul had done to Timothy. Indeed, they were passing the very same baton that Paul passed to Timothy that had been passed to other disciples for 2,000 years and was now mine to carry for a season and also to pass on. You know, in the summer of 2008 in Beijing Olympics, uh, American runners suffered a humiliating defeat in the 4x100 relay. We had a fast team. It was the fastest in the world. And we were leading in the last leg. But in that anchor leg, when Darvis Patton handed the baton to Tyson Gay, Tyson Gay never got the baton. In the middle of the handoff, they dropped the baton. Tyson Gay was our best sprinter. We had the best team. We were way ahead of the field. It did not matter. They dropped the baton and they lost the race. In fact, they never finished the race. And Paul uses a similar kind of analogy there with Timothy in chapter 2, verse 5. He says, Timothy, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Timothy, do not drop the baton. If you drop the baton, we lose. Guard the gospel. Contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Now, minimally, that entails two things. We continue in the things that we have learned. Back to the basics. We get it right and we get it deep. And then we pass the baton. So let me ask you a question. Who are you? And I'm speaking to you as individuals now, not as the church. Who are you, 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 passing the baton to now in an intentional fashion? Who are you parenting in the Lord? And you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be an apologist. You don't have to be a philosopher. You just have to be a faithful Christian who takes what you have and passes that to a younger Christian in some way. That's an intentional process. You're doing it on purpose with the idea of taking that baton that's been handed to you by someone else and passing it down the line. 
And if we disregard this solution, we should not be surprised when we remain children tossed to and fro and uh, carried away by every wind and wave of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness of deceitful scheming. Ephesians 4. We shouldn't be surprised when Christians get picked off, in other words. If we don't follow his advice, we should not be surprised when we are taken captive by philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. We shouldn't be surprised when Christians grow up with a different way of looking at the world than Jesus did. That's Colossians 2.8. We should not be surprised when we will not endure sound doctrine, but want to have our ears tickled, accumulate to ourselves teachers after our own desires. Second Timothy 4. You know, in that discussion with Father Coiro and Greg, uh, Dennis Prager and the Jewish audience there, it's an awkward situation for me to be in. When I give the gospel in a clear way and my, what appears to be my Christian brother takes it away. And it's kind of hard to have a fight with him on the stage about that. Right? Everybody watching, this is not going to work. But I couldn't just let that pass. And so I politely asked Father Coiro, I said, Greg, can you give any biblical evidence, New Testament evidence for the confidence that you just offered our Jewish friends here. Now, I knew there was none, but here's what he said. He said, well, you know, Jesus said, whoever's not against me is for me, and these people are not against Jesus, so they must be for Jesus, and Jesus did say that. Now, I let that lie because I couldn't carry it any further. But after that session, I went home and I went back to my Bible. Because Jesus actually said two things like that. He said, whoever is not against me is for me. But in another place, he said, anyone who is not for me is against me. Now, that sounds like a contradiction until you read the context. And once you read the context, you find out that Jesus was saying these different things regarding two different groups of people. And in the first case, you have the disciples concerned about another group of people working miracles in Jesus' name, but they weren't part of the inner crowd. And they're saying, hey, Jesus, uh, maybe we should shut these guys up, man. They're not with us. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Nobody can work a miracle in my name and then speak against me. Let them, let them alone. Whoever is not against me is for me. But when Jesus was talking to Jews who were resisting his messianic claim, he said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So let me ask you a question. What kind of group were we talking to on that Rosh Hashanah? A group of people who are working miracles in Jesus' name, or a group of people who were Jewish and rejecting Jesus' claim to be the Messiah? Certainly the second, not the first. Father Coiro got the wrong verse. Now, you know, like that happens. You can't, I do that sometimes. In fact, I did it on Saturday, Friday night at the session. I got something wrong. You know, I thought about it later. I said, no, that wasn't the right verse. I got the wrong one there. I wasn't bothered about him getting the wrong verse. I was bothered by him having the wrong theology that he could possibly think in the New Testament supported what he taught. Because if that's the case, what happens to the Great Commission? It's gone. It's irrelevant. When Jesus was speaking to a group like we had been speaking to that day, he said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John 8, 24. When Peter was speaking to a group like we had been that day, he said, and there is salvation in none other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And he kind of added, if you don't like it, lump it. It's a paraphrase. What he actually said is, 
Whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. But we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. That's Acts 4. That's Peter who was trained by Jesus. When Paul was writing to a group like we had been speaking to that day, he said in Romans 10, I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance to knowledge. For not knowing about God's sense of righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness for everyone who believes. The key to surviving the spiritual onslaught of the 21st century, contending earnestly for the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints, guarding the gospel, is found in two simple phrases. Continue in the things that you have learned. Back to the basics, back to the word as it's been entrusted to us. Continue in that truth that's already been revealed. Forget about the fads. They are just distractions. And two, entrust it to faithful disciples who will be able to teach others also. Pass the baton, in other words. And that's it. The truth, boldly proclaimed, faithfully guarded, carefully passed on, that is how we contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And not until we do that can we say what Paul said at the end of this magnificent letter? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And brothers and sisters, this is what I want for me and what I want for you. I want for each of us to live our lives in obedience to the word so that when we finish our course, we will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Dear Savior, that is the desire of my heart for me and for my friends here today. We cannot do this alone. We need you to help us accomplish that. And so we ask you, fill us with your spirit. Strengthen us by your spirit. Help us to guard the gospel, to continue in the things that we have learned, to pass the baton. For Christ's sake, amen. As we worship God through our offerings, let us draw encouragement from the Church of Macedonia in 2 Corinthians 8. And as Paul testified, for they gave according to their means and even beyond their means, of their own accord. This missions month, may we, like the Macedonian church, give ourselves first to the Lord and entrust to Him in full our generosity. Let us sing the song that talks about the goodness and the greatness of our God.
May you go out there and take the name of Jesus with you. Take it everywhere you go. And then contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. God bless you all. God be with you.